So Tanner, we were, we were just talking about the one Moonlighter that you've met before was Tim Dwight. So how did you meet Tim Dwight? Uh, first year out of college, I was coaching at Abilene University, and my head coach was actually the guy that put on all his camps. Abilene? Abilene? Abilene. Abilene. Here in Kansas City. Okay. So it's like right off 435. Um, he was a head. He was my head coach there. He recruited me to Baker, where I played, and uh, so got in, and, and I was doing special teams for him. And he set up camps for you know you name a guy, he set up uh, kids camps for him in years past. And he just happened to be running Tim Dwight's that year I was coaching there, and said, hey, come on up, and we'll, we'll get y'all set up. And I, you know I met Tim and and told him a little bit about what I was doing, trying to do before I got picked up by the Jets, and he. Said, good. You're gonna run special teams for me when we <laughs> start camp. Okay. <laughs> so you run special teams at Tim Dwight's camp. You, of course, came to fame from your times with the New York Jets as a long snapper. Yes. So when was the first time you ever snapped a football through your legs? Uh, from what my mom says, I did it uh, probably two or three years old. I could do it without falling on my head. <laughs> So it was something that you started doing from a very young age. Always. It was always something I did because my dad was a long snapper in college, uh, played offensive line, and my grandfather, uh, he was northeastern Oklahoma. He did it uh, before he went to Korea. So it, it was just something everybody in the family always did. Um, but it was really odd for me because I played quarterback too. So. so in high school, you were both the quarterback and the long snapper? Yeah, I got a lot of weird looks whenever you go from quarterback and then on fourth down you get right down and you're the center. So, you know, I, I did that at Baker as well for four years. So, Hold on. So you're playing a as a college quarterback, and then on fourth down when the punt team comes in or the field goal team comes in, you're long snapping. Yeah. First few years I, I backed up freshman, sophomore year, got some playing time. Uh, junior, senior year, uh, played, played a little inside receiver too, just kind of – Wherever they needed me, I'd play, and then you know, fourth down field goals was mine. Did you ever get a bunch of cheap shots? Because you got to think that the other team is going to want to sucker punch the quarterback if they get a chance to. They try. They try. It was nice. Uh, I think my sophomore year is when they installed the rule to where uh, you couldn't hit the center. That's the right. Down. So you get a good technique of getting out of there. You know, my freshman year, the, the way we ran punt, it was center just free release. He runs down the field. Typically, most guys would run out of there and they'd have a linebacker straight across and knock your head off. I got smart enough to just bear crawl out of there and then take off. <laughs> um, then when we got a new coach my sophomore year, we went to the pro style uh, punt to where center has to go back and block with the rest of the guys. So that, that really helped me later in the years, you know, come to find out. But uh, it kept me from releasing too early and just getting so you played the two positions, quarterback and long snapper, that nobody could touch during practice. So did you ever get hit? In practice, uh, I usually went looking for contact. I was, you know, I wasn't that fast. I was, you know, had, had a good arm and wasn't scared of contact. So. When did you know that you were good at long snapping? Like good enough to play in the NFL? Good. Uh, so it's a funny story actually. Um, Senior year, I'm, I'm dating my wife now. Who's right over uh, there? Yes. Hey, Kara. Hi. <laughs> she uh, she took me to a game. Her dad uh, used to be the chiropractor for the Chiefs and was in good with uh, some of the, the older players that are uh, the uh, what's the alumni guys at the games. Uh, Louis Aguiar and Kelly Goodburn, uh, they're good friends, and so we meet up with them in the parking lot at, at halftime. We go outside the game. Game's over. It's a preseason game. I think it was the Panthers. And I was literally dressed about the same way I am now, you know, boots, jeans. American uh, flag. Oh, yeah. And uh, then uh, they get in their little argument, as they always do. Two punters, you know, two old guys. I can still do this. I can do that. And, you know, I bet you I can, punt, I can hit that car over there about 40 yards out. And so they start doing it. And they go, her dad goes, uh, my father-in-law, he says, hold on, hold on. Let's get a real picture. Have him snap it to you. So I'm there in boots and jeans. I snap a ball in a parking lot. And they both go. Whoa, do that again. And I did it four or five more times, same spot, same speed. And they're like, you need to gain about 30 pounds because you can do this for a career. Okay. What was it about the way you snapped it right then that made them think that you were good enough to snap in the NFL? Speed and accuracy. It's, I could, it, it wasn't too fast, tight spiral. Um, 
and the fact that I could put it wherever I wanted it. So the original question I asked you was, when did you know that you were good enough to snap in the NFL? And you just told me a, basically a tailgating story. Oh, yeah. So before that, you didn't know that you were good enough? No, I was a 210 pound quarterback. Well, right. Why do I think I'd be able to do it in the NFL? I mean, it, it took three years uh, of working out, coaching, uh, camps, tryouts to actually get in. Uh, my second year out, I got a few tryouts. My third year is when I got picked up by the Chiefs for uh, preseason and off season, and then you know I got released preseason, and then the next year I got a call out of the blue when I'm um, substitute teaching back in Waco. No way. And uh, yeah, it's like five messages on my phone, people freaking out. I'm like, check your phone. Okay, so got the GM there calling saying, hey, we're gonna bring you in for a tryout. So and it wasn't even for me. I was just I was live fire for the punter they were looking at because their snapper wasn't there. They wound up keeping me instead of the punter. I, I gotta imagine that there's not a lot of guys that are staying in shape that are long snappers. Is that part of it? Like that oh, are usually usually because I, I've so Justin Drescher, I don't know if you remember Justin Drescher, he was a long snapper for the Saints for a lot of years. Yeah. And then I think a little bit with the Chargers and the Broncos. And the way he got his job was he went to South Lake Carroll, Texas, yep. where Chase Daniels from and Greg McElroy and Nick Foles. Yep. And so the Saints, their kicker Graham Hartley went to South Lake Carroll. The holder at the time was Chase Daniel. Mm -hmm. And then so when their snapper got hurt, they called, well, we snap with this guy in high school, so let's bring him in for the tryout. And it seems like there's a rhythm there that the rest of the world doesn't know about. So what is it about that rhythm between the holder, snapper, and kicker that exists that none of us know? The reps and the ability to be able to know what the other guy's going to do every time, know, know each little tiny detail. It, you know, it was nice enough that I got to play you know, seven years with Nick Folk, uh, you know, after he came up from Dallas. You know, he, he got there, I got there all at the same time, and it was, it was a, you know, we were all starting fresh. Right. The only guy that had been there before that was uh, Steve Walton. So, you know, doing all the reps, I, I, I used to like to get a lot of reps just to, that, that's how I learned, that's how I got better. I, and, and over the years, uh, I mean, you could tell the difference in the years when we'd get a new punter, which wind up being the holder, and the, the time it would take, it would take, all off season and most of the preseason to get the rhythm down to where we were all back comfortable. Like I knew what Nick was going to do. I could do. I could time him out with my eyes closed and know exactly when to snap it without even counting my head or anything. That's just how many reps you take at it. Uh, it it's just getting comfortable with each other. So is that a silent count then? Because you uh, talk about depends. you knew what Nick was going to do and Nick was the kicker. And so why did? Isn't Nick dependent on your snap? He is. He is. Um, it's more on the setup. So the way we did it was a little different uh, with Coach Westoff. Uh, he had us to where I would stand and I would turn around. So I'm standing over the ball. I turn around and watch. I watch Nick take his three steps back, two over. And as soon as he tapped his right foot on the ground, his toe, I would turn around and I'd tell the line to get down. I'd get set up, take a big deep breath, and as soon as that hand flipped up, ball's gone. And it was literally just that, that you know, you do it enough times, it's, it's just natural. Right. Did you have the same holder your entire time in New York, no, too? No, I didn't. We had, uh, let me think, one, two, three. I had five punters, so I had five holders. Five punters, five holders. So, but you're talking mostly about the kicker. So what was the most, more important part of the equation for you? Was it the holder or the kicker? Um, it, de it depended. Uh, a lot of it was, uh, you know, I got to get used to the holder. Um, you know, best holder I ever had was Mark Brunel. I was lucky enough to have him for one year. He was, was like 70 years old at that oh, time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was his 19th year. It was, uh, it was fun. Actually, I, I made him uh, embarrassed one time because I told him that uh, the first professional game I'd ever been to, he was a quarterback. <laughs> You're so, probably like 10 years old. Yeah, I was, I was like 12, so... <laughs> Um, it was cool to play with him. Uh, he was one of the greats. You know, I don't think one one time that whole season we missed laces. Uh, they're straightforward. That's um, that's cool. So let's let's walk back, Tanner, to when you get that call. You're substitute teaching 
in Waco, Texas. You, Chip, and Joanna are down in Waco, and you get the call while you're substitute teaching. And what's running through your head at that point? Well, I was just I was like, okay, well, I, you know, I was on lunch break, so I walked over to the office and told them, you know, uh, I gotta miss uh, my next two days. I hope you can pick it up. And, and you know, the secretary is one of the moms of one of my friends that I went to school with. And you know, she's like, oh yeah, go, you know, whatever you gotta do, it's not a big problem, you know. I was like, well, I gotta go to tryout. She starts freaking. I'm like, whoa, it's just a tryout. <laughs> Chill out, like, lady. Like, calm down. And so you know, I call and I, you know, call my wife. She's at work, so she didn't answer. I turn around and call Louis Aguiar because he's helping me get in, and and he, uh, you know, he's like, oh, you know, just just kind of going through everything and, and kind of freaking out. I'm like, everybody, would you relax? It's just a tryout. And and you said it was a tryout for the punter too, right? Yeah. So they were trying it out. They were trying out an Australian kid. The 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 current uh, snapper was he was free agent, so he wasn't on premises. So they needed to bring somebody in to give him live fire so they'd get a real look at him. And, and lo and behold, I, I snap 40, 45 balls, and they turn around and offer me a three-year contract. How in the heck did your name come up? Like, you had never snapped in an NFL regular season game at that point. Why did they call you? So it's uh, Louis Aguiar used to put on uh, pro games. Okay. So you'd have college guys, and, and you know, you'd have 50, 60, 80 guys a weekend and he'd get scouts to come out, you know, and Louie's good enough at, at what he did, that he had about 28 of the 32 teams that would show up on this weekend. And I had had, uh, you know, I got nothing my first year. Second year, I tried out Green Bay and Seattle, and then uh, the Chiefs for a little bit. Um, I get the call because it just said, hey, everybody's already signed, it's February, we need a guy just to be yeah. a feeder. There's he not goes, a lot of free agent, yeah. long snappers it, it, just hanging out. Exactly. So, you know, Louie was in with uh, one of the scouts, and the scout said, hey, I know a guy. Let me call him. And he goes, yeah, uh, the first, first name on my list, list is me. So, you know, I just get that random call. <laughs> I know a guy. He's a hell of a substitute teacher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fly him so, out. <laughs> so basically, I mean, that's that's. it was just a really weird kind of thing, and it was, it was coincidence, and, and, you know, the... The saying goes, you know, if, if you're good enough, they will find you, and, and you know, they found me. Yeah. So let's talk about that trial. Were you nervous at all? You said everybody else was freaking out, but you get there, you snap it 48 times, and every one of them was perfect. Did it just feel like a normal day, or was that just a good day for you? At, at that point, it was just, you know, having been a quarterback in, in, with any high-pressure situation, it's not, it's not as high-pressure to me. Uh, just weird about it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a coach's kid. It's, it's one of those things I got drilled into me is once you start playing, shut your brain off. Just react and move yep. and and do what you're told to do. And, and you know, so they told me snap the ball, snap the ball. Right. So I, I really didn't stop to think until it was over and I'd sign the papers and I, I call my wife and I go, hey, uh, I'll just let you know I, I just signed a three-year contract and about that tone and she was freaking out and, and you signed it on the spot yeah that day they they uh we got done with the tryout they said go shower up and they uh go okay you know told the punter you know we'll we'll give you a call you get in the van i was like <laughs> thinking i'm like okay let's go to the airport and they take me to the doctor's office i'm like why are we here like oh we're getting your physical like, okay sure you just want to have that on file i guess i'm like no big deal to me. I get back to the facility, and they go, yeah, they want to see you upstairs. I'm like, wow. They want to give you the usual, you know, we'll keep you on file. You know, you'll be on our list. And they go, yeah, we really liked it. So uh, here's a three-year contract. So what made <laughs> them so confident in your tryout that w made them sign you to a contract that day? Was, was there such a need for it, or were you just that good? Uh, probably more of a need, I would say. But, um their guy was nine years in, um, a little older, a little more expensive. Yep. I'm a cheap rookie with a little bit of experience, and they'll sign me to a cheap three-year league minimum deal and make do. What's awesome about that, too, is you know, you're a Midwestern guy. You go to New York for a tryout, and you sign with the New York Jets – during a really interesting time in New York Jets football history. Oh, yeah. You got 
Mark Sanchez as the starting quarterback, who at that time when you come, he's the biggest thing out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, he had just led them to the AFC championship game. Rex Ryan had things really going. One of the best characters in football history. What was it like as a guy that substitute teaching in Waco, Texas, to sign with those New York Jets? The, the team and the coaching staff and Rex, to me, having grown up, uh, you know, a, a coach's kid, you know, yeah. having my dad coach college for most of my life and being around all those just coaches, you know, at, at the smaller levels, Rex and the staff and the way everything was made it feel like home. It, it felt like when I was little and, and they acted just like the, the coaches at a smaller college and the guys joked around and nobody was better than anybody else. Everybody got along like it was just it was fun. That's awesome because Rex Rex's dad was Buddy Ryan, mm-hmm. so Rex is a coach's kid. Mm-hmm. He comes from a football family, so you probably saw a lot of yourself maybe in Rex Ryan, or maybe a lot of your dad in Rex Ryan. I saw a lot of just everything that I witnessed in the successful you know times that that the staffs I was around when things were going good. That's that's the things Rex tried to to emulate always and tried to you know push towards us it, is just you know it's a game. Have fun with it. Don't don't be out here and just be all uptight and worried about it. And if somebody gets on you, have thick skin and get over it. Yeah, you know it, it makes it it makes it so much. You play so much harder when you're or training so much harder when you're running. You know you're running next to a guy and you're cracking jokes about each other and you're just laughing instead of breathing hard. What type of shape do you have to be in to be a long snapper? Um, for me, it was always one of those that that. I didn't take that many breaks. So as soon as season was over, I, I was chomping at the bit to get back even after two weeks. I made myself stop for two weeks, and then it's just right back into training and a progression of be ready to go. The, the biggest part um, for me, my thought always was of training was uh, injury. Don't get injured. Don't, don't overtrain. Don't undertrain. And don't cause an injury because as soon as you get injured or as soon as you start showing a weakness like that, they'll send you home. Well, so you bring that up, Tanner. But one thing that I saw during your offseason training was you like to box in the offseason. And so the first thing I think of, if a long snapper likes to box, I'm thinking, well, you might bust your hand up, which would be so vital. You can't snap a ball if you got a busted hand. For so sure. why did you box? Uh, honestly, I got yelled at by my uh, – Special teams coach. He's, he was one of those old cranky guys. You know, Mike Westoff. You want to see him? He's he. Coached, I remember him from. He uh, coaches for the Saints. So yeah. um, he uh, he was a big deal in hard knocks. Oh yeah, hard oh, knocks. Yeah. Followed I was the sitting Jets. in the front row while he's yelling at me on live TV. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, were you on hard knocks? Yeah, that was your year. Yeah. I got to go back and watch it now. Yeah, I'm sitting like right there in the front row while he's just berating me about every other game. Just, just raking me over the coals. What could he be mad? You never had a bad snap in your entire career. And, well, and that's that's the beauty of Mike. It's it's he wants to make practice uh, so hard, and he wants to make you just so uncomfortable in meetings that once you get to the game, it's simple, it's easy, it's fun. He's relaxed. You know, we always used to joke he's the greatest, one of the greatest coaches in the history on game day. Every other. You know, time, I don't even want to be around him. Just, <laughs> just but, you know, you got to know Mike and, and you got to love him that way. And, and I, I do, I love him to death. And, you know, he, he helped me become the snapper I wanted to be. He pushed me in that direction. And, and he's the one that said, you know, you need to, you need to just go try boxing. And, and the year I started doing it was the lockout year. So we have all off, se- you know, most of the off season and even into training camp where, we had nothing. We weren't even allowed on the facility premises. Mm-hmm. So I had to find a gym. So I was like, well, let's go look around. I, I go to Planet Fitness. No grunting and no dumbbells over 90 pounds. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's out. And so, you know, I looked around and I found found the, the boxing gym right there in uh, New Jersey. And, and I just, I loved it. I, I just, I have boxing stuff in my basement now. I'm, I'm coaching at Baker now. And I have some kids that I've been training on Fridays. They come in and, and do boxing there. It's just you never busted your hand up? Nope. No. I mean, you, the, the, it was nice enough that I had a couple guys, um, some ex-boxers, you know, a couple number one contender guys in New Jersey that, that we adapted stuff right. to, you know, not so much boxing where you're covering your face. It's 
more, you know, hands at chest level. So it's, it's a little closer to football to where it, the biggest thing is you're learning how to strike and you're learning how to, to Use make leverage, contact. Then. Yes, your footwork along with your contact and the timing of your punch and how to punch to where you make the most impact with the least damage to your body. So as a long snapper, you were a college quarterback at 210 pounds, but a long snapper is part of the line. Mm-hmm. And so you got to block some guys on field goals and on punt team, but you got to sprint down the field on punt team or block somebody there too. Yep. So I got to imagine you had to put on some weight. What was your playing weight in New York? Uh, playing weight, rookie year was 245. Uh, I got up to 255 in the middle there, and they finally let me kind of pick my own weight. And and 250, I was very comfortable, was very strong, uh, faster, a little quicker. I I felt better at 250. Yeah. Now, a lot of the articles that I read was after Tanner Purdom gets released, you were the longest tenured guy on the Jets when you were released. And you, you at that time, you were the only guy for the Jets who had played in the playoffs. Yeah, and they're like fan favorite Tanner Purdom gets released. That's every article. If you Google your name, it's the fan favorite gets released. How in the hell was a long snapper of from the Midwest a fan favorite in New York City? Uh, some of it was the last guy. You know, if you play there long enough, that they're they're just loyal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, most of them, you know, from what I'm told and what they've told me, it's it's they they love the fact that I walked in, did my job caused no waves and went home blue collar yeah and that's it and it's it's i i I, you know there's there's interviews out there where i've said before it's if you know my name i've done a bad job i don't want you to know my name i don't even want you to know my face (laughs) name on the back of my jersey and we're good yeah so it's it's people like that and and you know i wasn't in the media didn't try to be in the media too much and just i did my job and and i didn't ask for too much money and just the opposite of what you see on the headlines. Right. Well, speaking of that, you had Mark Sanchez was a quarterback, and mm-hmm. he was on every magazine cover. Rex Ryan couldn't keep his name out of the headlines. So what was it like being on those teams with these huge personalities? It's just people don't get to see the real them a, a whole lot. It's it's both of them were just, just little kids. That's that's all <laughs> it was. You know, Mark was like, you know, I'm I'm four years, five years older than him. By the time I start, and he's already got a year on me in experience, and it's like, it was more like he's a little brother than than anything. It's like, dude, really, you're going to do that? And just, it's just, right. it's just kind of how it was, and how the chemistry of the team was. It was just every, it was just one big family. What was the locker room like when Rex Ryan's wife had that tattoo with Sanchez's jersey on? Oh, it was just jokes. It was all <laughs> sorts of jokes. I mean. You, you could that do, was like the craziest thing you'd ever seen in the media. Yeah, you could do all sorts of things. Like uh, when Jason Taylor did the, the what is it, the shot in um, Sports Illustrated. Oh, the naked thing. Yeah. We took about ten of those and just posted them all around the locker room. And, <laughs> and they, they made a life-size one we printed out and put on one of the walls. and it, It's just stuff like that. It was everybody – was on the same level. It didn't matter how big of a star you were, but everybody's it's it's one big team, one big family. Yeah. What was your favorite game for the Jets? Uh, you know, everybody asked me what's most memorable and things like that. Uh, favorite, I'd probably say the game after we beat the Colts. You know, game winning kick from Folk, and, and you know that's that's huge. But the next one when we played the Patriots after getting crushed on Monday Night Football, butt cold weather, and, you know, just, I mean, they beat us by like 40 points. They crushed us. And you go back in there in the playoffs, and that stadium is silent. Yeah. When we finish the game, it was like one, that's, that's one sound I, I just remember hearing is just low-tone grumbling for about 10 minutes at the end of the game. It was great. That's amazing. Yeah, beating – the Patriots in the playoffs. There's not many guys yeah. that have, can say that, and they're you know they're playing up again this weekend. They've been doing it for 20 years now, and so you're like you're one of the select few that has beat Tom Brady in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean we and we'll and turn around and go kick for kick with uh, Vinatieri for the Colts, and it was just because we kicked one, 
they turn around. He, you know, Mr. Clutch kicks another one, and then we turn around, and Cromartie gets us to the fifty. We get another ten yards, and we just, you know, Nick wails away, and it goes in. Amazing. Yeah, Cromarty was on that team too. Oh yeah, man, you had so many characters well, on that my, team. My locker mate is Santonio Holmes. <laughs> Two overs, Bart Scott, then Eric Smith, and uh, you know Revis, and and it was all just our little corner. You didn't come over in our little corner because you're going to get railed as soon as you come over here. <laughs> so what was what was practice like for you? I mean, you're talking about all these guys, and like I get it. You know, wide receivers got to run routes at practice. Mm-hmm. Middle linebackers got to be leading the defense. What does a long snapper do all practice? Drills. Like just, what? You, I mean, you just you just break it down. Uh, for me, I had about five or six drills that I like to do that that were were most useful for me. Um, the biggest one, you, you, you look on Hard Knocks. It's they loved. They used to love to sit there and film it because they'd never seen it before. Is where you get the uh, it's a big um, tackle dummy that is on this. It's on a big metal rail, and you you push it on a decline and it swings down and you're supposed to run through and hit it well i didn't have anybody big enough to rush me so we could work on blocking so i go hey let's go use that thing so you know you got folk right there throwing this 200 pound bag at me as soon as i snap the ball my head's between my legs i snap it to steve and then i gotta get back shuffle back and block this thing and and honestly that one drill helped me create my punch and actually know like learn how to block and not just catch somebody right have you seen steve weatherford lately i have not seen steve for a few years but he is huge he pops up on like paid for ads on my facebook and he's like the most cut up guy in the world (laughs) and it's like him with his shirt off looking like tony perkis from heavyweights it's like i'm steve weatherford i used to punt in the nfl yeah and now look how jacked i am that's that's Steve. I mean, he he really got into all that stuff after uh, Super Bowl with the Giants. <clears throat> I mean, he was with us. He was pretty cut up and and all that. But he just went like full bodybuilder after the Giants. Right. Yeah. yeah he's just totally cut up now. Oh yeah, dude. Dude's huge. He's, so he's a freak. What's your life like now? You're back here, living in the Kansas City area, yep. coaching at Baker University. But you're what? Thirty four years old. Yep. Thirty four years old, retired NFL player. You know what? What do you do now? Oh, well, I mean, today I, I went and, you know, met some kids uh, for weights, 730. Um, after that, you know, ate breakfast with a couple of coaches, made a, fu- a couple uh, recruiting calls, and I didn't have anything else to do because all I do is coach kickers, and I called those guys that I'm trying to get. And, and, and after that, I just went home. Do a podcast with the Moonlight yeah, Ram Show. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of those things. I mean, during season, it's a little more active, but, uh, you know, there, there's not a whole lot to do. Uh, you know, it's nice, but it's also like I'm looking for things to do right. as a special teams coach. Where I'm, that's just all I'm doing. Do you think that you could take a guy with the right body type and the right work ethic and turn him into an NFL long snapper? I could turn him into what he wanted to be. If he wanted to be that, and he had the work ethic to do it, you know, I would have the I have enough people that I can call to get him in the right position. Now, to, for me to make him one, I can give him all the tools. He's got to open that door. Mm-hmm. It, that that's all on him, and that's that's kind of how it was for me. Is I knew guys that that helped me get in front of people, but just because they got me in front of people and I look the part or I do the part doesn't mean you know doesn't mean that that i'm going to get that chance it's it's one of those things that you know i can tell i i can train you to the best of my ability i can give you all the knowledge in the world but i'm going to say can't i i personally can't anything i do can't make you an nfl player that's that's the player himself so in your entire nfl career you never had a bad snap yeah and you never committed a penalty yeah why did you get cut uh bilateral tendonitis so snap enough I, balls. I sell insurance. I don't. Yeah, I'm not a yeah. doctor. Here. Uh, so Explain that one to me. Snap enough footballs, and you know, having my last couple of years having a rookie rookie punter doesn't help every oh. few years. So Under there's the there's there's a lot of reps because they need the reps. They need to catch, and as your body gets older, you just don't recover as fast. So when I'm snapping 100 balls a day, and I don't have anybody come in to relieve me most of the times 
in training camp you'll have you know camp leg or you'll have an extra snapper to take the uh, reps off of the guy right. so you won't crush him before season. Well, I never had one of those. I never even had a backup. It was you snap, you get broken, tape it back on, go back out there. Like that's just how it was right. for eight years, and and, and you know it, it. Eventually, it just it just caught up with me. You had in your career two solo tackles. Do you remember who they were against? I had not, well, yeah, I had one in Atlanta. Um, the first one, no, I've had more tackles than that. No, actually. <laughs> no, not, not as of stats. <laughs> Not not as of of their stats because they don't ever. There was a bunch of good. like group combo tackles they call yeah. them, but there was only two solo tackles. Oh yeah, no, no. So I'd, I'd look at them and go, look, I was a quarterback, so I'm gonna run down over here and I'm gonna make sure he doesn't have a touchdown. Yeah. So, well, Tanner, the way we end every episode of the Moonlight Graham Show is with the five big questions. Okay. And the first question is, who is your all time favorite teammate? Hmm. That's that's a that's a lot that of good That is a teammates. tough question. That is a tough question. Um, just for the years and, and hours we put in, probably Nick Folk. Just just uh, you know, call him up, and it's it's like we've never been apart. So. Uh huh. And how long did you and Nick play together? Was it all seven years? All seven, yeah. All seven years. Mm-hmm. What's he? Where's he at now? Is he out of the league? Yeah, he's uh, living in Dallas. Living in Dallas. All right. What is the most amazing thing you've ever seen on a football field? Um, probably some of San Antonio Holmes' catches in our playoff run. Just a guy that you would walk down the street and wouldn't even look twice at him, and he's going out there and making these just sick catches against some of the best corners in you know in the game. It's it was it, it just it's hard to describe when you see it live and, as opposed to on TV. And wasn't San Antonio Holmes the receiver who caught that pass from Big Ben? Didn't he later go to the Steelers and he caught the pass in the back of the end zone? Uh, the he came to us after the Steelers. Okay. So he was already NFL MVP for Super Bowl when he came to us. Yeah. So he was amazing. What's the hardest you've ever been hit? Uh, let's see. Probably my first or second year playing the Bills. They always used to send their two biggest guys over the, uh, the snapper on field goals. Uh, one of them hit me on top of the head so hard I sneezed. <laughs> Who yeah. was it? Uh, I don't remember. It was, it was just, I think he was 360 pounds. Is that a penalty now? Now it is. Yeah, because well, it was two or three years ago they changed it. You couldn't line up on the center anymore. Well, you couldn't line up on him. Yeah, on field goals, you used to be able to just line up right over top of him, just drill him. Yeah. And then on field goals. But um, three years ago, it's to where you have to be outside of the, the edge of my shoulders. Okay. What are you most proud of, Tanner? Um, just that I, you know, I played the game, you know, how I wanted to play it. And it was, wasn't flashy. It wasn't huge. It wasn't crazy. It was just I did my job. I did what I was asked to do, and I did it well. What's the best advice you've ever received? Probably that every day somewhere in this world, someone is working harder that is already better than you. So don't let them take your job. And so you got to feel pretty good with that advice that nobody ever took your job. Yeah. You know, you have had a flawless, literally a flawless NFL career and did your job every day. Yep. It's, it's one of those things that you look back and, you know, watch on Sundays. I think my wife watches more football now than I do because all I see is film when I watch a game. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things you're like, huh, I've been out a couple of years. It's kind of weird. <laughs> So. Yeah, does it look like a different game to you now? Somewhat. Players are a little different, but, you know, the game's a game. It's uh, some of the new rule changes don't don't exactly agree with special, special team stuff, but, you know, just got to adapt and keep going. Right. So before we wrap it up, you know, we just finished the Christmas season, the holiday season, and I had heard from some of our sources that you like to throw a holiday party, Christmas party. Oh, yeah. And um, you got a special – 12 shots of Christmas that you guys like to do. Could you explain the 12 shots yeah. of Christmas? Uh, 12 shots 
we started that in uh, my fraternity. Now, my fraternity is a little different. You, you picture Animal House? Yeah. Times 10. <laughs> uh, yeah. You, you had, when I joined, it was 45, or you know, it was 50 members, and 45 of them were on the football team. Oh, God. So it's Meathead City. Uh, sophomore year, you know, we're thinking of parties, doing whatever, and, and I was like, I got an idea. <laughs> so, you know, I, I basically, I, we create a shot list. You have 12 shots. And then every 30 minutes, you take a new shot. Now, if you stay on course, you don't deviate, you don't take extras, don't get too crazy. Yeah, you get a little buzzed. You know, it's not going to be too bad. But you get those brave souls that, that start taking the extras and start you know, drinking two beers between shots or something yep. like that. Man, they have the worst night ever by the end of the night. <laughs> so it's like it's over six hours. So it's it's a heck of a party, and it was, it was the funniest funniest thing was we as soon as we get back, um, I see some of the guys at a couple of the games, and they're like, "Hey, we doing twelve shots this year?" I'm like, "Might as well." So I have you know fraternity brothers come over, uh, they do it, you know. So you're still doing this like 15 years later? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, they 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 requested. Has it, it so gotten I was better like, Might or as well. worse with age? It's. I think it's gotten a little better. We enjoy, it's. It's nice because it's like one of those that you get to. You know, guys you spent hours on hours with and played with, and you turn around and it's like we're doing the same party we did when we were kids, and it's. <laughs> it's, it's still and in the no same. Way is that depressing. It's still the same arguments. It's still the same jokes. It's still you know. It's fun being right. around those guys. You know, a couple times a year, and it, it's just it's nice to have. And be able to, to to do it again. What do you miss most about playing football? Then is that camaraderie with the guys that you just described? Uh, yeah, I mean it's half that, and just just half the fun of of competition. Like literally, everything shy of punching each other in the face and still being able to say, you know, hey, what's going on? Right. You know, it's like I'd play against a guy I played with in Kansas City, and well, we're getting down, getting ready for a play, and he goes, oh yeah, how's the wife? Like, oh, how's yours? You know, how are the kids? <laughs> you know, it's one of those deals. And then the next, you know, as soon as the ball snapped, it's let me tear your head off. Right. And then right after the play, it's going back to being friends. That's cool. So it's like a brotherhood. It is. You know, the it football is. World. It is. It's uh, once you know, once you're in that kind of select group, you're always in the group, and and you're always kind of recognized. You can you, you can pick them out of a crowd. Yeah. Once you've been there. Well, yeah, you walked right into Stockyards Brewing. Thank you, Stockyards Brewing. And right away, you can tell you're a football player. You got the hips, broad shoulders. You know, you're not built like like me. So I'm and, and imagine this. I'm I'm about, I'm about mid size. Yeah, I'm middle of the road for size in the NFL. I mean, there's dudes that are just freaks. Yeah, I mean, the NFL is so specialized. So you have six, eight, three hundred forty pound linemen. You have like receivers like Santonio Holmes are like five nine, one eighty five, mm-hmm. and then if yourself there's like. 250 pounds and it's crazy how that game has become so specialized now the long snapper itself if the long snapper gets hurt it's not like somebody on the team can fill that role like they need to get a special long snapper yeah you gotta bring you gotta bring another one in it's it's you know who's the backup in my my playing experience i never had one but what if you got hurt it's that that wasn't an option is what i was told (laughs) um you know lucky enough i never did but you know, every guy I trained, it became a curse. As soon as I got him good enough to say, hey, he can be the backup, two weeks later he'd be cut. It's crazy. Every time. I quit doing it. I was like, no, I'm going to send you sign you a death warrant. No, no, I'm not teaching. No. Uh-huh. I don't want you to get sent home. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tanner, it's been a lot of fun having you here on the Moonlight Graham Show. You are the perfect guest for our show, the long snapper who never had a failed snap in the NFL. So thank you for so much for joining our show. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. <laughs>